We're in a series called Present Future Church, and we're looking at what it means to be the church today. And um, the whole point of the series is to look at what the church was, is designed to be according to scriptures and looking at um, what it might look like for us to be uh, the future reality of the church pulled into the present. And for me, it's real simple. It's very tangible. What I'm hoping to do is preach in a way that inspires us to be a church that allows my children to grow up in a healthy environment. I really have this passion um, because I, I, I was wrestling with this question all week long. Why is it so hard to be the church? Like, why is church so hard? <laughs> like, I don't know what your experience has been, but I've been asking this question because I've uh, talked to tons of people that have been healing from their pain from the church. I just, it, Gandhi once said, if it weren't for Christians, I'd be a Christian. Isn't that interesting? Like the greatest problem, like our missiology of the church, our, 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 our mission to renew the world, to save the lost, to, to transform culture has been impacted by the people that make up the church. <laughs> like we're the greatest threat to the mission of the church. That's what I've been realizing is the problem is here. It's internal. It's the church. We are the problem. Um, there's a study done by Barna a few years ago in a book called Unchristian where he looks at the top perspective that non-Christians have towards Christians. And of the 12, top 12, nine are negative. And these are the top ones. Number one, that Christians are anti-homosexual. 91% of non-Christians see Christians as anti-homosexual. And I just want to say from the stage that you as a Christian cannot be anti-anyone. I don't know how you feel, but you can't be anti-terrorist, anti-pedophile, anti-convict, anti-women, anti, -convict, anti, -women, anti like, there's no place because we're all children of God. And I think it's fascinating that the perception that the church has, or the perception that the non-Christians have towards the church is that it's, it, it's anti-someone, which is really hard to understand. The second is it's judgmental, which which we all struggle with this one. I confess last week, like if I could do your life better if you just let me handle your life. That's judgmental. Like what is that? Wow. Pride in the easiest form, in the greatest form. So we're judgmental, we're anti-hypocritical, or we're anti-homosexual, we're hypocritical. This one is really insidious. This is the one that just perverts the mission of God when it's basically somebody saying one thing and then doing another thing. Like, I mean, in fact, in Acts chapter six, there's a story of that and it's quite scary. Ananias and Sapphira say one thing, this is what we got, and then they do something else. They give a different amount of what they got. They lied and then they die. <laughs> Welcome to church. <laughs> Can we pass those buckets one more time? Just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> We're just gonna, we got some carpets. We'll roll you out just like them. Just kidding, just kidding. I'm just, I, it's the Bible. It's just the word of God. I don't know what you, why am I the beggar? And the last one, I actually, I like old fashioned. I feel like old fashioned is coming back. So whatever, that's like a positive. No, I'm just kidding. But church is hard. Wouldn't you agree? Like talking to people in our church, I realized like there's so many people in our church that are hurting from their experience of church. Church in its design from the scripture is to reveal God to the world. Like this is a beautiful, like church are where is the only place where you come and you reveal the creator of the universe, where a group of people come together to reveal this good and beautiful God who reveals himself as love and grace and kindness, as, as Jesus reveals him as the, the father who takes off running after the prodigal. Like that's the image of church and yet what we get is anti-homosexual, judgmental, hypocritical, old-fashioned and the list goes on. And I'm talking to people and there's so many people in our church that are healing from their previous church experience. And they're, it's not something to joke about. People have been abused by church leaders. There's, they've been a part of churches that have had um, domineering leaders. They have been a part of churches. There are, like we have baggage as church. We have baggage. We care a lot. We caused the crusades. We justified slavery. We have systemically organized and hid clergy 
abusing children. Would you agree with me that we have some historical baggage? And that's like, and it just gets, you know, and it just gets worse. But people come into this environment experiencing the presence of God. They get saved by Jesus. And then they enter into this thing and they have all this new life and they're growing and they're learning. And then they, they join church and it becomes really, really, really hard. And, and, and if you've been a part of a house church, I mean, this is so, this is just reality. We're gonna launch house churches again this t- next week. And I just wanna prepare you. Because everything in our culture wants to destroy what church is designed to be. In fact, you have been groomed to counter everything the church is designed to be. Like you have been formed by culture to resist the kind of movement that is required for you to make church easy. That's what I wanna talk about. What is needed in the future church? What are the things that I sense the Lord is saying about where we're going. And I talked about this, that where God, I think what God's doing in this moment across the church is he's looking for people who are hungry for his presence, who won't confuse a mood and an environment shaped with stage lights and sound as the actual presence of God. People that actually know the difference between a a formed experience and the presence of the divine. Second, and people who hunger for that. Second are people who are pursuing holiness, recognizing that this Western myth of progress and utopia is a lie, and we are in a moment where the church has to respond with purity and holiness. We actually have to stand our ground in the kingdom, and I I, I think holiness is simply being useful in culture. Culture is drowning in anxiety and despair and depression, Um, a culture that's fragile and falling apart, a culture that doesn't know how to have relationship, a culture that doesn't know its identity, doesn't know what to do with power, doesn't realize what privilege looks like and what to do with it. And we, as people pursuing holiness with Jesus, become people who stand on dry ground to pull people out of the drowning culture. Holiness is usefulness. God's looking for people who are pursuing holiness. The third is today is he's looking for humility. Humility. And this is not something that's talked about very often, but he's looking for a particular characteristic that's required of God's children. And that's what I want to look at today. But why is church so hard? Here are a couple of ideas that I came up with. Number one, uh, diversity. What other organization or institution on the planet is is as diverse as the church? Where it doesn't matter what language you speak, what culture you have, what race, what ethnicity, what um, gender you have, uh, what, your, what, your, what political affiliation, whether you're uh, a Democrat or Republican, um, what your socioeconomic status is. Literally, this is the only place that actually none of that matters because what matters is we confess that Jesus is Lord. Everywhere else you go, those distinctives are more important except the church. I'm not saying, so diversity is a gift that we get to steward and we have to steward it as the church today, all right? And, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit, about our, our responsibility and rights um, when it comes to power and privilege. Uh, I wanna talk about that really clear as a white male who has inherited a system that has been bent towards my favor. In a na- just, and people wanna debate this, but there's nothing to debate in, our, in, in the American context. And it's not something that we have to apologize, I have to apologize for it, but it's something I have to educate myself in and with and learn to do what Jesus does with power and privilege, which that's what we're gonna talk about. But diversity brings conflict, obviously. Would you agree? Like, have you ever been to a Cambodian cookout? It smells different than a southern southern state's cookout. I remember when we were having our church um, uh, bar, we would have our church meeting in an old church building on 4th and Elm where when our, the garden started, there was like 12 of us and we met right after the Cambodian potluck. And there were some smells I did not prefer. <laughs> Which gets to my second point. We live in the personal preference of a Yelp review world. So 
we've been, and this is formed by point number three, um, which is individualism. So I'm going to hit on the personal preference thing. We live in a culture. We swim in a culture. It's like we can't even, we don't even recognize the lens through which we see the world through, which is this thing called individualism. We actually believe we are autonomous individual selves. I mean, what we don't realize is we're being shaped by massive institutions, we are being shaped to consume. You just have to do some research on this. Everything that you, every ad you have, every, every pop-up is being, you're being carefully curated by, gov- by not government, but by big, by big business to consume. So you're not autonomous and individual. You want to buy those jeans because um, you've been looking at them and then they've been popping up at every, every single time you open up your screen of any kind. That, that gene is popping out or, or those shoes or, or that style. That, that's literally what's being curated. So we're not individual autonomous selves, but we think we are. But we live with individualism. Individualism is this concept that you are the most important person in the room. Your dreams, your job, your family, your way, you matter most. You're, you're you are the most important person in the world. And so since you were a little baby, you've been groomed into that reality, which brings up the personal preference thing. So your preference is how you feel, which by the way, our culture says your feelings are Lord, not Jesus. So organize your life around your feelings and what makes you feel comfortable, safe, and good and pleasure. And so you in, in, engage in the world through this individual concept And then um, you interact with the preferences, like a Yelp review. So you can come into a church environment with this mindset that you've been shaped by, and it will destroy the witness of the church, which doesn't exist for you. The church is the only institution that exists for the outsiders of its institution. That's, That's interesting. We'll talk about where that comes from in just a second. I'm just trying to build the case. But the personal Yelp review. I mean, th- I mean, do you think it's interesting that you can literally Yelp churches today? We have a Yelp review, by the way. I read all of the reviews. One of them says, two stars, Darren, Pastor Darren, looks like he's 25, preaches for 30. Just to clarify the Yelp, I'm 35 and I preach for about 50. Thank you very much. So we have this world that we live in. It's funny, it's getting worse. One psychologist did a big study and came out with a book called The Narcissist Epidemic and said that two out of three college students have narcissistic personality disorder. It's it's hard. We live in a culture of individualism. Your truth, your way. And the fourth reason I think that church is so hard is we have an enemy working against us. There's not neutral con, uh, territory here. There's an enemy resisting you. And he's not resisting you like, like, uh, like a scary movie, demonic, like doll that's been possessed by some demon. Sorry, I didn't mean to go there. Or like a clown hiding in gutters. Like that's not, <laughs> I, I, might, I'm, I, I don't like scary movies. I, but you know what I like to do? This, we're not gonna podcast this one. For some reason, <laughs> I like to watch the previews with the volume off and see how far I can go before I shut it off. I just like that feeling. I just want to be a little scared because my imagination runs wild. I'm like, I'm done. I'm done. I can't do it. Nope. Friends send me pictures of creepy old dolls and think it's funny. I have a thing against dolls. I don't know why. Like dolls are scary to me. Anyway, so that's not how the enemy comes. He comes with you saying, with entitlement. He comes with, hey, what did they mean by that? And then, the, and then the seed grows into a forest of, of, of question and doubt and then collection of injustice. Oh, they did it this time. They did it this time. Oh, they hate me. They're with them on that post. That post, I'm left out. I'm not good enough. I'm this, that. That's how the enemy divides the church. So subversive. Now, Paul faced all of these issues in his time. And except for Yelp reviews. They weren't like, he wasn't like, hey, what do they think about my church in Philippi? What? They're being killed. They weren't doing that. So, you know, Yelp review looked different. They're just, oh, we're just going to cut your head off or throw you in the thing and, and whatever. So he didn't deal with like the type of consumer oriented junk that we live in. This shame culture where we just want to put people in stocks and throw vegetables on them. That's what we use online for today. Um, we live in a shame culture. 
Paul didn't deal with that, but he did deal with the fact that the point of the church is to reveal Jesus to the world. And he was doing everything he could to protect that mission. And what I love about Paul is um, he wasn't trying to teach some philosophy to a bunch of people so that they'd have this secret knowledge to bring them to this place of enlightenment where they're disembodied from their everyday life. In fact, that's the opposite of Jesus. Paul recognized that Jesus was the incarnate son of God, meaning he was flesh and blood, meaning he had bones, he lived um, and breathed and ate meals. And so for Paul, everything he, he talks about, his right and perfect theology was grounded in human ordinary practice in life. So you can't be this ideal of community unless it works itself into your everyday existence. Does that make sense? So he writes to this church in Philippi, in Philippians chapter two. Um, I wanna look at this passage. This is about this idea of becoming the church that embodies humility, Um, but looking at Jesus as the model. And we'll get there in a second. But Paul writes to this church, and this is like one of his favorite churches that he planted. He had favorites, just like 11 o'clock, you're my favorite. So... (laughs) He writes because it was one of his first churches planted. Um, some scholars believe it was led by two women, by the way. just want to throw that out there, that the purpose of um, the, the issue is there are two women in, in a home leading a, a house church, and they had conflict, as people do. Are you with me? So this isn't a woman's issue. This is a church leadership issue in general. And he's trying to remind them of the mission of living life worthy of God and, and how to do that. And he's talk, he talks about the key to unity and love is, is suffering and humility. Um, but, but again, Philip, I'm going to just kind of illustrate this. Philippi would have been a house church. So it wouldn't be a big gathering with professional lights and whatever, you know, speaker. It'd be like, okay, we got this letter from Paul. And, and this section right here, you guys, from this, from you, Ezra Down, we're the house church. And we get this letter and Paul knows that, that Will and Ezra are fighting. They're leading this house church. Or I guess it'd be like Faith, Faith and Amy. Perfect, yeah, Faith and Amy. <laughs> like Amy is just killing it in youth and Faith has this worship culture and they're just, they're like, which one's better? And, and, and Faith's like the next generation, obviously, or Amy is, and then Faith's like, yeah, right, worship. We gotta get people to, to pursue the presence of God. And Amy's like, we have to go after the loss with the young life. And I'm just this conflict, and there's this debate. And then there's like crowds and groups forming in this little tiny group. Like Will's like, yeah, I'm on a- team Amy. And then, yeah, Christy's like, I'm team Faith all the way. That's what's happening in Philippi. And but what you don't see is that there's really, really wealthy people and really, really poor people. And there's Gentiles, and then there's Israelites, there's Romans, there's Greek speaking, there's uh, Arabic and, and, and Hebrew speaking, and, and there's, there's women and men, and they're slave and free, and they're all right here. And they, they're trying to be human, because they don't know what it means to be human with Jesus as Lord. And Paul's trying to teach them, no, this is what it looks like. And they're in conflict, they're bitter, there's like ongoing issues, there's posts. There's Instagram feuds and hashtags and hashtags and Yelp reviews. And this is what Paul says. He's like, guys, verse two, or verse one of chapter two, live a life worthy of the calling that Jesus gave you. Therefore, if any of you, if you have any encouragement from being united to Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, if you have a freaking spiritual bone in your body for the love of Jesus, is essentially what he's saying. (laughs) Like if you've experienced anything at all that is good in Jesus Christ, this group, you're gathering, if any of that, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one of mine. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, and this is the key to unity and diversity, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Okay, Paul, like, here's the deal. 
first of all, I get it. Spiritual bone, yes, I love Jesus. He saved me. I can sing some songs. I've experienced, okay, I get, like, so he's, like, getting it to the basic, like, if there's a spiritual pulse, not even a strong pulse, like, we have a pulse type of moment after doing the compression thing. We got a pulse. It's barely there. But we, if you have any of that, have the same mind. Be one in spirit together as a church. He's like, you have to guard unity. You have to go, you have to lay down whatever it is to be one. This is so important. This is essential. If any of those make my joy complete, having like being like-minded, same, this. And then he's like, okay, do nothing. <laughs> like uh, this line, I, I literally I was reading it, and the only way I could describe it, and it's probably not gonna make sense to you, but it makes sense to me. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility. Consider others more valuable than yourselves. That's, that is like a Netflix Bob Lazar alien show. It does not make sense. This is not true. This, it's like, all right, in view of that Area 51, you're like, wait, what's Area? Oh, it's like Area 51, like conspiracy theory type of craziness. Paul's talking crazy. This is, what I, this is the only way I can describe it. I have no illustration other than this doesn't make sense to our culture. In humility, think of you more than I think of myself. What? Humility in that context is so countercultural. Humility was reserved for um, a class, a social class that was lower class. Like if you were part of the superior class, you would not want to be humble or in hum or be uh, or live in humility. It was seen as like a lower status. And in the rules of empire in Rome, you were all about winning. It was about upward mobility. It was about more. It was about conquest and domination. And Paul's saying, no, 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 no. Like you take the lower seat. You take the lower status. Humility is not even a fun word. In the, uh, the uh, Webster Dictionary, uh, humility is defined as um, a modest or low view of one's own importance. Whoa, I do not like this word. One other, I like this one better. It's a freedom from pride and arrogance. Yes, that feels a little better. Just a freedom from, uh, Tim Keller says it's self-forgetfulness. Just let that sit in there. Like you don't think of yourself as much is the goal for Christian community and being one. You think of yourself less. I like to say humility is an accurate view of self. I think you should write this down. Accurate view of self. What do I mean? Pride is an arrogant view of self, puffed up, elevated view. And insecurity is also pride because it's an inaccurate view of self. Humility is recognizing that where you stand in the cosmos. You are made of dust and divine. You were formed by dirt and the spirit of God was breathed into your soul. You are made in God's image and you need to be saved by grace. You are more than conquerors, co-heirs with Jesus, and have access to an inheritance. Oh. And by the way, all of that is by definition privilege. What do I mean by that? Something you didn't earn but received and, ongo and continue to receive from. So the question is, well, what do we do with that privilege? What do we do with that power? So humility is how we learn to operate in our culture and in the church. It is the solution for the, re, uh, the issues of church being so hard or community being so hard. This is what we have to pursue. This idea of humility, of taking the, the role of the servant and the slave, of having this mindset of regarding others as more, more important than ourselves. And so for, for Paul, Jesus is the model for life. So whatever issue you face today, Paul makes this argument that Jesus becomes the model for how we are to live. Husbands, are you struggling in your marriage? Do you have a hard time um, dealing with the conflict that it 
brings when you say I do to somebody and all of a sudden they are a completely different person than you and have all sorts of expectations about everything in your life, including toilet paper, budget, sleeping patterns, hanging out with extrovert, introvert, all. Anyone know what? I'm, husbands, follow the way of Jesus. Well, what does that mean? He was never married. Well, Jesus, uh, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. The model. He becomes the model. Uh, and it, you, you want to deal with money and issues? Well, Christ, who was rich, became poor so that you might become rich. 2 Corinthians 8. Jesus is the model. So Paul will all over the place in Romans, in Ephesians, in Galatians, in uh, Philippians, use Jesus as the model for how we are to live. So he goes in verse five and he's gonna continue his thoughts. So think of other interests, interests, the interests of others. He says in verse five, okay, in your relationships with one another, house churches, community groups, small groups, life groups, whatever you've experienced, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Have the same mindset. Now, in Greek, it's mindset or attitude. And I think attitude's a little better. And why do I say that? It's because I have a five-year-old. And my five-year-old will um, do what I asked him to do with a really bad attitude. Do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> it's like, hey, bud, um, I already asked you, take out the trash. Fine, I'll take out the trash. I'm taking out the trash. I'm dragging all the trash and water spilling. This, or whatever, like, you know, like, or hey, bud, you don't hit your brother with a wooden spoon. <laughs> Say you're sorry. Sorry. That's not what it's, sorry, Amos. Like, it's just, no, you gotta, you gotta have a better attitude. Attitude, mindset. Do you know the difference? So it's a little bit more than just, okay, I'm going to have this philosophical mind of Jesus. Because the reason I don't like that is because you have this view and this mindset, and then you actually get into real community. And all of a sudden, like, that mindset is confronted with someone who doesn't know boundaries. Somebody who wants house church to be a therapy session for themselves. <laughs> Somebody who had like this crazy experience somewhere else and is forcing it here. Somebody who doesn't like being told what to do. Somebody who wants to tell everyone else what to do. Somebody who's really charismatic and kind of strange and a little off and they're kind of dancing and that's not a thing we do necessarily. And then other people who are really weirded out by the spirit. So you, you're confronted with diversity of perspective and the mindset of Christ is not just something that you must believe here, you have to live out there. You with me? So he says, have this mindset of Christ. And then he breaks it up and he breaks it up and he, he quotes this hymn. So Philippians 2 is this beautiful hymn that early Christians recited before the Bible was written, the New Testament. So like they had this hymn they were going around sharing. And so, so Paul just quotes this hymn. He says, this is about Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. It, I would just circle to his own advantage. The Greek word is harpagmos. And it means to grasp, grasp or seize violently, to take for himself. Harpagmos. Um, by, by taking... So to his own extent, rather he made himself nothing, and just circle made himself nothing, which is kenosis, which we'll come back to. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in the likeness, human likeness, and being found in appearance as a human, as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. <laughs> cross. So you got this poem, this Christian hymn. It has to do with Jesus being made in the likeness and image of God as equal with God, all the character and attributes of God, but does not see his equality with God as something to be used for himself. So he had all the power and privilege of heaven and access to the things of heaven, disposal of legions of angels, of raising all of the dead, of resisting the pain that would, he, he would endure in the cro on the cross. He has access to all those things as, as God, but does not use that power and privilege for his own advantage, harpagmos. Everything in Roman culture was harpagmos. You won by killing the other people, by having a bigger army, 
by, by domination, by conquering. And this isn't far off when you think about the American culture today. Upward mobility. We win. Well, first of all, we don't ever want to talk about the loser. We want to be winners, right? So like this is everywhere. So it's all about domination. You go to work and you lie and you cheat or not you obviously, but other people lie and they cheat to get the promotion and get ahead. And, and then, or, or if that person gets the promotion and you don't in your workplace, they talk, they gossip about you to slander you for why you got that position. That's Harpagmas. Harpagmas is achieving and grasping. It's like the New York Times article that came out saying that Ivy League schools, kid, parents start getting their kids in Ivy League schools in second grade at private preschools. That there is a competition, it's like $50,000 a year for a private preschool to get you prepared. Like two-year-olds, our pogmas, achieve, win. I experienced this when I took Ezra to soccer last year for the first time. I never played soccer in my life. I don't know anything about soccer. We did an entire year of soccer, still didn't learn anything. Four-year-olds playing soccer. It's basically watch them run around the ball the whole time. And then there's probably one or two kids that know what they're doing and they score, they score like 50 goals. That's literally what happens in like little soccer leagues or I-Y-S-O, A-Y-S-O or something. So anyways, um, but I remember the first, the first practice, I was nervous because I'm a dad who played sports, just not soccer. And I'm like, all right, you know, here's the coach. Coach is a young dad. He's got his soccer stuff on. I'm like, hey man, I, I, I've never played soccer in my life. Hi, how are you? That's literally how I'm like all nervous, you know? Like, I'm sorry. Um, and, then, and then he's like, hey, that's, that's not a worry. How long has your son been playing soccer? And I'm like, uh, he's four. Like, <laughs> this is literally his first, we bought the ball today, actually. <laughs> so go get him, Ezra. Um, and he's like, oh, that's okay. We have like a club thing. We all kind of pitch in on Tuesdays. So you can come on Tuesdays. We can practice on Wednesdays. And if you want on the weekends, we can kick the ball at the park. I was like, wait, he's four years old. But it was like this mindset that's everywhere. Like it's start, you gotta, gotta, they gotta win. I mean, we see it in the education system. We see it everywhere, right? And, and it's this harpogmas, this like power, this seizing, this grasping, this I gotta make sure I get what I need. It's upward mobility. But Jesus does kenosis. Kenosis is this beautiful Greek word and it's self-emptying, to empty himself. And this is the model. What do we do with power and privilege? What do we do when we receive something that we didn't work to earn? What do we do when the system is designed for us to win and keep others down? Those that have the privilege and power, whatever that looks like, use it in the way of Jesus and leverage it for those without power and privilege. Those with power and privilege must use whatever power, your relational capital, your intellectual capital, your financial capital, your physical capital, the, the body that you have, the health that you have, um, the, the life, the resources, the time. Use it to empower others, to pour yourself out. Jesus' life is to be obediently pouring himself out towards others. He doesn't use all that he has access for, for himself, but rather gives it away to others. And as a result, we receive that grace. Isn't that crazy? That actually the way we're designed to be church is to recognize there are people in this country and other places that don't have the access, that don't get to play in the same game because of institutional systemic injustices. And we need to change that. Like Jesus, flip the table, talk about it, say I'm sorry, listen and go all out as we love each other. This has to happen. This is not a political conversation. This is a Jesus conversation. What did Jesus do with his power and privilege and resource? He gave it to others. We can enjoy the things that we have, but we should invite others to enjoy it with us. This is, this is the conversation we need to have. This is my secret 2020 campaign to get our church recognizing that does not matter if you think Trump was sent by God as a prophet or Trump is the Antichrist. Because in church, Jesus is Lord and raised from the dead. Those things don't matter. But let us be certain that we reflect the Jesus of scriptures, not the Jesus of an agenda. And he will offend both sides. 
And you must learn to be okay with diversity. We will not be a church that has the same political view or the same kinds of people. We must celebrate diversity. How do we do that? Don't look at your own self. Look to the interest of others. We will offend people. That was already offensive. I know people in this church don't believe that there's such a thing as white privilege. And that's hard. There's debate. We think it's about a liberal agenda. I'm not talking rights and responsibilities for the sake of, of progressive or, or, or conservative ideas. I'm talking about what I see going on in our own context, in our nation. I'm recognizing that Jesus, when he takes a look at what he has access to, in John chapter 13, just check this out. Let's just look at the Bible. John chapter 13, it says in verse three, this is the moment before he goes to the cross. He's with his guys, his disciples. John chapter 13, verse three, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from, the, from God and he was returning to God. He had in the moment of dinner, he's having dinner, he realizes, oh man, I have all, all the power of heaven right now at my disposal. He doesn't take a selfie and tweet it out. He removes himself. He takes off the garment that would distinguish him from someone sitting at the table in a slave's outfit. He becomes a slave to the room and does the most unthinkable thing any rabbi should do, does what even Jewish slaves were exempt from doing, and he washes the feet of his brothers and sisters and said, this is now the model of power. You wanna know what to do when you recognize you got the promotion, you got the money, you have the access, you have the knowledge, you have the resources, you have all, this is what we do. We get on our knees, we take off the garment of significance, and we wash the feet of the least of these. This is the image of the church of the future. It has to be humble. It has to take all the power it's been given to to, em to empower those without it. This has to be the cry of the next leader, that we cannot be leaders that think about platforms and celebrate the American way. We have to celebrate the Jesus way, which was the downward mobility. And he has the nature of a servant, a nature of a slave. Not some like practice of the way of a slave. Not some like once in a while inspired to be a servant. The nature of a servant. That's the model we're given. And that's more offensive than anything else we could say. This is what you're invited to be. Humble. To live like Jesus. And if you want the solution to why church is so hard, it's here in this text. It's right here. All we have to do is have the mind of Jesus. It's that simple. So how do we do this? How do we be, begin to inch our way towards a type of community that reflects this type of Jesus to the world? Because I know some of you are already frustrated. But, but if this is where we go as a church, a church that empowers others, a church that looks as good and beautiful as Jesus, a church that is fighting for unity amongst diversity, that looks like the church of the New Testament in the future, what are we gonna do? Because I know it's, it's gonna be hard. Um, I wanna give you some, some thoughts, but let me just say this. Francis Schaeffer says this. He was a, a philosopher who, before he passed away, had this like prophetic kind of rant about the church. He wrote this, and he was always writing 40 plus years ahead of the, where he was at. He said this, the American church has to care more than just about personal peace and affluence. If the borders of your heart extend only to those you know and care about and your efforts to provide extend only to the borders of their provision and the church will die and become irrelevant. And isn't that happening in our world today? If you listen carefully, you can almost hear the death rattle that personal peace and affluence have brought to the modern church. So what do we do? How do we build this mindset? Number one, I'm gonna give you some practicals. Look up and pay attention. So I wanna give you baby steps. And this is what I feel like God's been showing me in my own life. Um, look up and pay attention. You must move yourself from looking at yourself to looking up towards God and begin to pay attention to the world around you. So much of our life is curated to keep you literally looking down on your phone. Like, I mean, this is just the image. I feel like we can talk about sin issues in the church. We could talk about the cultural wars. We could talk about politics. We could talk about all the issues. And I just, I felt like the real issue right now is getting people to go from this 
to engaging the world like this. I mean, it's a simple micro habit. Walk into the place around that you're at. Be wherever you are and pay attention to who's around you. Pay attention to what God's doing. Pay attention to the room and begin to think. Just look up. So stop. So I have the second, second one is look out. So look up. Second one, look out. Consider others. When you show up to house church next week, for those of you that sign up, don't go in thinking, oh, where do I fit? Will this meet my needs? Oh, there's a ton of young people. I'm older. I'm in a different life stage. I need to find people in my life stage. Maybe it's actually, let me be a gift of diversity here and fight for diversity. I'm the only one with kids in this group. I I wonder how they feel. God bless you for doing that. They need to see parents, parent kids, when they're single or they're young married. It's like we need all of us to be, begin, excuse me, to learn to live in diversity together. Like, I, I, I don't under, I, I, I can't say this enough. Like, if you are part of a generation that's older than millennials, Gen X or, uh, or, um, or baby boomers or the great, we have some that are part of the great, the great generation. We need you in community in our church. We need you to lead communities in our church. I was at pre-service prayer and there's nobody, there's barely anyone over 40. I'm like, come on 40 year olds, come on 50 year olds, come on 60 year olds, come on 70 year olds. You have permission. What do you want? For, I'll, I, will make, I will make a red carpet for you because we need you in, my, in our lives. And so if you feel isolated or if you felt like we're young, let's change that. Help us change that. Because the next move of God is not a one generational movement. It's a multi-generational generational movement. Everyone has to play a role. So look out to other people. And when I'm, and consider others, guys, be proactive in your connection and community towards others. So many people engage in life and it, because it's so self-focused, we're never thinking, what could I give? What, are, what do they need? How do we support, like what is God doing in this moment? So a girl in our church is celebrating getting her first apartment and, and or um, moving from transitional housing into her first apartment. Celebrate, we get to celebrate this single mom doing that in our church today, she got keys. And a, last week she's like, hey, um, she's like, Pastor Darren, I, I got keys. Like we're move, I'm moving my family. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Congratulations, what do you need? She's like, we don't need, we don't need anything. I'm like, are you kidding? That's amazing. God, like God's providing in your life. You're, you're conquering habits. You're, you're bringing health and wholeness. You're breaking poverty, all these things. What do you need? She's like, we don't need anything. I'm like, okay, what, do, what can I give you? She's like, we might maybe could use a fridge if you know anyone that has an old fridge. So the next day, text my elders. Our elder team, I love our elders. Text our elders, hey, does anyone know of anyone that has a fridge looking for a girl? first question back, hey, I don't know anyone, or first response, but let's buy them a a new fridge. Here's a Venmo. And then it was like, Venmo, 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 Venmo. It was literally like, okay, we have more than enough. Let's give them a gift card too. Like that is what the leaders of this church do when a single mom gets their apartment. We celebrate and make, that's proactive. What do you need? How can I, how can I be a part of the solution? I was talking to my friend who was in uh, Colorado and he's flying back and, um, this group of a, a biker gang he walks by called the Diablos were flying back and they were in the, the terminal with him and he sits down to eat dinner and he's reflecting on all that God did on this men's retreat and, and, or breakfast or something and, and then the, the Diablos sat right next to him and they were making a ruckus and he was paying attention and he felt like God said, why don't you go up to them and ask uh, if, if God could do a miracle in their life, what would it be? So uh, one of our elders walks up to this table of biker gangs called the Diablos. <laughs> hey, I'm so-and-so. Uh, if God could do a miracle in your life, what would it be? <laughs> like, uh, they start bantering, and he's like, look, I just want to pray for you. I want to see if God could give you a miracle. What would it be? And one guy goes, pray for my kids. So he's like, right there, I pray for this guy's kid, and da 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 Awesome, who's next? And then they're like, oh, you know what? We all have bracelets on for a friend who needs a kidney transplant. Pray for that kidney to be transplanted. So he prays right there. And the whole experience changed. 
talking to him, talking about Jesus. They live in Oceanside. Come, he, this guy's like, hey, you know what? I want to know if he's healed. Here's my number. Tell me if he gets his kidney healed. Just follow up with me. Let me know. I'll be praying for this guy. Our church will pray for this guy. And, and then they leave, and my friend, le- or my friend leaves, and then he goes to the terminal, and sure enough, they're on the same plane. So everyone's lined up, and there's these big old biker gang guys, the Diablos, and our, one, of our, one of our elders is like, hey, guys, what's up? Hey, there you go. Like, oh, everyone's like, who is this guy? Friends with the biker gang. Doesn't that sound like Jesus? He could have just been on his phone reading and doing his devotional with Jesus. Or he could be Jesus. Look out. Be considerate. Concern yourself with others. Be proactive. And, look. Uh, and then the last three, I'll just end real quick. Celebrate differences rather than criticize them. Hey, you want to you wanna do something amazing this election season? Ask questions of people that disagree with you and don't demonize them. Just learn and then continue to, and then build a relationship. Don't try to convince them of your view. Don't demonize them or argue. Don't criticize their perspective. Don't criticize somebody's difference. In fact, celebrate it so that you can see how God sees his children. It will change your heart. We live in a critical culture. We, we really do. We, we are entitled and critique everything, even churches, even Pastor Darren. But I look 25. That's a good thing. I don't think that's negative. (laughs) I don't think that's negative. So celebrate the differences rather than criticizing them. Uh, Fourth, most important discipline, um, commit to community even when it's hard. There is no perfect community. Next week, we're launching house churches. And I guarantee you'll get so excited if you join. um, And then you'll want to leave a couple months in. Because it won't meet your needs. It will be the, enti- uh, the, you know, the, the, the enchantment or the, you know, the moment where you're, you recognize like this dream state is gone. You'll just be disenchanted and you'll opt out. Um, but if you want to know the secret to building meaningful relationships that last for a lifetime, commit to a group of people for a lifetime. <laughs> it's not a secret. It's not a secret. Just... <laughs> Just, yeah, we'll do this together and then fight for it, which leads to the next one. Number five. Talk it out and forgive. Practice healthy conflict. You can't be in community without conflict. You can't be church without conflict. Kingdom cannot expand without conflict. We have to get really good at conflict, church. That's why we're doing emotionally healthy spirituality, emotionally healthy relationships. That's why we're talking about FPU. That's why we do house churches. At the end of the day, you will be in conflict with somebody at some point in your life because you're a person. And you will be confronted with conflict in your relationships, with your family, with your family of origin, like your parents or your roommate. If you have a roommate, you already know there's conflict in the room. Guaranteed. I mean, literally from you ate my Chipotle burrito that said my name on it. How is that even logical? It's, not, it's in my section in the fridge and it has my name on it, but you still eat my leftover Chipotle burrito. Like that is not a human thing. Straight from the de- demonic pit. And I will exercise that roommate for you. I never had that happen to me. But I should probably text that guy, my old roommate from 2006. See, conflict, you carry like luggage. Am I right? So what do we do? Talk about it. Commit to connection. Don't blast them, react, respond. If somebody sends a text message that offends you, don't text them back right away. Wait 24 hours. Someone sends you an email, don't respond having to prove why you're so mighty and right. Give some space. Let, take count to seven and breathe and sit on it. Don't destroy, you could invite God or you could just wait and that will be enough. But the thing is, don't destroy relationship because you have to be right. So church, I want to be a beautiful church that reflects Jesus into the world. So be humble. Be humble towards one another. 
Be humble to, in the world. Take the posture of a slave. Take the nature of a slave and wash the feet of your businesses, your coworkers, your roommates, your school, your classroom, your teachers, your students. Wash the feet of your neighborhood. Wash the feet of the city. That is the future church. And in your relationships with one another, look up. Get off your phone. Get off yourself. Look out and be considerate towards others. Number three, celebrate differences. Commit to a community. Stay in it and then talk and forgive. Can I invite you to do something in response? We're gonna stand and pray, but can I invite you to do something? I think right now, the Spirit is speaking to you about conflict with people, some of you. That, they, that you are in bondage to unforgiveness. There are people that have hurt you and you have justifiably been wronged. But that place of unforgiveness in your life is now a cage in a prison that you carry around. And here's the thing. You can forgive someone and not be in a relationship with them anymore. Do you know that? There are some people that you could, should not be in a relationship that cross boundaries, that create ongoing pain, but forgiveness is a process of releasing them back to God. Some of you are in bondage to, in unforgiveness to people that you don't need to be in a relationship with, and that's okay. Some of you are in conflict right now with people in community, at work, in your life, or even in this church, and you're hindering our witness because of your personal unforgiveness. So if you have a freaking spiritual pulse in your body, <laughs> make my joy complete and go forgive them. Go talk it out and deal with the conflict. Amen? Amen. All right, let's stand.